the children really are, are the future. So I really do believe in empowering the younger generation because they are the ones who are going to make a difference. I might, I might already be too late to make a big impact, but the impact they will make, that's crucial, especially at the stage that we are right now, where we have, if you look at the statistics of um, how the climate is changing, the children are the future and they, they are the crucial, crucial turning point uh, within all of this. My Brit Christensen is my guest on this episode of Inside Ideas, brought to you by 1.5 Media and Innovators Magazine. My Brit is of Scandinavian and Mediterranean descent and upbringing, which triggered her passion for circularity. Um, when you hear circularity, you might think, oh, what, what, uh, circular living, what is that? Uh, circular economy, circularity, closed close loop type of living, being, and passion. Her interest and understanding of circularity led to past and current experiences with startups in Silicon Valley, World Economic Forum in, in Davos, local NGOs and private projects. Serious childhood health issues led her to explore lifestyle and food options that were maybe a little bit different than the norm. She reset her health, shared her learnings, and has been on the forefront of boosting health and happiness ever since. Her insights are applied holistically throughout all aspects of her life, including family, especially family, applying the next normal to boost the next generation. She co-founded ACT or ACT as a platform to reach more people. She keeps connecting to thought leaders to make her insights available anytime and anywhere. She has uh, two wonderful biological children, Magnus, who is two years old, and Mira, who is almost one month old, uh, November 22nd, who is right next to her, sleeping peacefully, but should during our podcast she awaken or anything, we will just continue on because that's the realities in life of, of, of having a wonderful family. She also has Mia, who is not biological, but a big integration and part of Andreas and, and her life, and uh, who is in most of the posts you see all, all around. And uh, we'll probably touch on all three children and some thoughts and beliefs of my Brit today. My Brit, welcome to the show. It's so good to have you here. I'm so excited. Thank you for having me. I'm excited too. <laughs> so uh, just so our listeners know, we originally first met at uh, Malta Innovation Summit. That's and, correct. Uh, yeah. And um, you were already pregnant there with Magnus, right? Pregnant with Magnus at the time, yes. You, you were pregnant with Magnus, but you had, um, I don't know I how. One, yeah. one week before I gave birth that we met. Exactly. And you, you were at the Malta Innovation Summit for uh, ACT and uh, with your co-founders and, and uh, kind of manning the booth. And I don't know, I think you also did some presenting or you guys were trying to get a prize or win something as well. Is that true? Oh, um, my memory kind of eludes me at the moment. But yeah, we were very much integrated in the, in the whole Innovation Summit in Malta. I'm not sure if we were participating for a prize though. I'm not sure we were. There, there was a couple in the prize and then I know you guys had a booth and, and uh, were, were there and I was, I was speaking and, and um, so we crossed, we spoke a little bit and, and that's where we first met. And, and I, I think that's probably the real first time uh, Andreas is, and I really kind of maybe exchanged a few words. Our paths had crossed several times before, but we we're always busy or doing other things. and. 
so uh, so that's really good just so our listeners kind of know the connection and and yeah let, I, remember, let, I remember your speech it was really interesting and you definitely captured the audience and you were talking about the donut economy which essentially has to do with circularity so it was really nice listening to you i appreciate it yeah um uh, it was good to be there. It was a great experience. And I've, uh, before that and since then, I've kind of uh, uh, had a warm spot for uh, the Maltese people and for Malta and people who are living there and expats and all sorts of different connections that I've had in, in uh, not only Kairos society, but also in um, the World Economic Forum and other groups and, and connections, you know, Kinternet around the world. So it's really interesting to see the connections and, and how people are interlinked that we're all, you know, such a, such a small place as Malta is actually uh, far reaching connected to many other places in the world and, and uh, has some beautiful things to offer. So I really like that. Yeah, Malta is very interesting. It's really tiny, but it brings many different cultures together. So it's, uh, it has a nice dynamic. <laughs> so you, uh, uh, as I kind of hinted to that uh, Mira's there next to you, you, uh, congratulations. So almost one month ago, you had a beautiful baby girl and uh, there was a really kind of a natural experience around it not only was it during the uh, still during the pandemic time maybe the second part of the lockdown or or things of the pandemic but um, uh, you know you, nine months of pregnancy uh i'm sure you experienced the the, the whole thing during the pandemic and i uh, would like to know kind of your insights your experience and then the process of uh, uh you had a natural birth and some kind of your your experiences there so i want to know what's happened during this time and what your your insights and, and things, because I think that not only that's part of you, but it's also sh it, it, um, shapes your views on the world as well. Yeah, it's um, it was definitely uh, an interesting journey. So we were, in the beginning of my pregnancy, we were actually in Croatia, in Zagreb, and um, it was when the earthquake hit. So uh, we, we, yeah, we experienced uh, an earthquake as well, which was quite intense. And we were together with Maya and Magnus and Andreas was there as well. So that was interesting. We ended up having to live for about one month, probably more with no heating. So we had no gas, no warm water. <laughs> so it was fun. It was an interesting experience. We kind of had to go back to our roots and uh, we were heating up water on the stove to be able to shower. <laughs> yeah, it was interesting to see and to experience because you really look back and say, people did this not too long ago, right? People had to heat up their own water. We didn't have access to instant hot water that we are currently used to and consider normal nowadays. So it was a nice awakening moment. Um, <laughs> To experience that and I had a great great support so Maya Magnus we were singing the day the earthquake happened lifting uplifting our moods so that was really nice the people around you really do make a difference um, yeah then I spent most of my pregnancy in Croatia which was nice because the initial lockdown there was interesting there were so, as in so that was one of the plus, pluses of being there. So we could go for a walk in the park and that was really, really therapeutic and super important during a time of pandemic. So it really does boost your immune system to be out in nature and be able to breathe some fresh air and exercise. So that was really nice. We then moved to, yeah, we had an interim period in, in Berlin and shortly after came to Malta and this is where I gave birth. And yeah, I, I did give birth at home. That was one of the most beautiful experiences I have had. And it was really easy going. I had great support. There's a doula here in Malta that is amazing. She, she, really, she really knows how to give that support to both, to all the members of the family really. And um, she made sure that the home birth happened uh, and it's 
an interesting contrast because at the same time I had friends who were giving birth and they were giving birth in hospital and their partners couldn't join them because they tested, they got a false positive for COVID so they couldn't have their part partner next to them. And also they had to wear a mask while they were giving birth and during labor, which is quite stressful. And I don't, there's something very restrictive about having to go through a process like that. So my heart really does go out to people who had to, all the expecting mothers and new parents that had to go through that experience. Um, but in contrast, I had a great, a great birth here at home, uh, right? right on, on top of us, uh, beautiful views of, of trees and flowers. And we had, it was just amazing, nice music. Everyone was calm, everyone was happy. And yeah, Mira joined, joined, us, joined us shortly after. So it was a joyful birth, really. <laughs> was was did you say that was your first natural birth or it was did you, did you? my second natural birth but it was my first home birth my with magnus i um i happened to go to um, a clinic which is close by and uh, to get checked because they asked me to go in and get checked and i happened to be close to giving birth despite not having felt any pain. So I ended up staying there because I would have ended up giving birth in the car on my way back home. So I didn't want to give birth in the car. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> the, uh, uh, the mobile baby delivery service, no, that wouldn't probably be the best. Well, yeah. that, that's fabulous. <clears throat> yeah, I, I am. You, you posted a few pictures and I, and looked like a very calm, nice setting and, and beautiful. And everybody was really excited. And um, I, I, uh, congratulations, wonderful time, great experience. And um, um, I'm glad that uh, Mira is uh, next to you and healthy and beautiful, the pictures I've seen. So um, that, that kind of gives us the, the question that I ask most of my guests right off the bat is how have you weathered the pandemic? Um, were there any other things maybe that were enlightening for you or, or that you experienced? Because you've been, you've been thinking about not only where you're at the Malta Innovation Summit, but uh, and the type of company act that you co-founded and, and the way of your thinking with circularity. Um, a little bit of that gives you resilience. It, it thinks of how you can be self-sustaining. How can you operate in closed systems? So during this time of not, not just the pandemic, but uh, Black Lives Matter and equality and, and crazy nationalism and all sorts of other things. One, you weren't in your, your, your home, you were in a, kind of stuck in, in Croatia and had some experiences there. Was there any other kind of aha or enlightenment moments or, or things that you would like to share with us that you, you say, you know, um, it, uh, a lot of things bubbled to the surface or there was a microscope shown on on uh, these situations that I dealt with in my life and, and maybe kind of enlighten us uh, of any, any kind of things that you've learned during this time. I think the pandemic really did test a lot of people. So um, it did test me as an individual and um, also it tested us as a family unit, I believe. And um, we actually, I feel like we got closer because of it. And, um, but yeah, it, it really helped us to realize that, you know what, any feelings that you have, any, anything that is crossing your mind, it's always better to talk about it and to express it. Instead of bottling it up and then exploding at any given moment. So that was really helpful for us. And we also encourage Maya to always express her emotions and her feelings. It's very healthy. Magnus also, and he, he understands, even though he's only two years old, he does understand. And he understands that he is, his emotions are welcome, no matter how, how, you know, sometimes he has a tantrum, of course, and it's welcome. And he's very happy to look at us and tell us, you know what, I'm sad now or you know, I'm very happy, or he, he does express his feelings and he does express his emotions. And 
that helps us to get through our life together in a much more holistic way. And the kids seem to be happy and they reset really fast after that. That's beautiful. That's nice to hear. And so then um, after you, you, you actually left Croatia and went a little bit to Berlin and then you're back in Malta now is where we're speaking to you from Malta. And, um, uh, you know, I, I've spoken to and Andreas on, on the show as well. And I keep in touch with you guys. It seems like you guys are doing good and things are uh, not back to normal, but you guys are, are really moving forward with, uh, you know, your, your philosophies and principles on a better way of life, a better way of li living, better way of interacting with governance on our world. And so that really leads me um, to some of my uh, first questions. And that is, do you feel like you're a global citizen? And how would you feel about a world without nations, borders, divisions of humanity? And how um, you, you plan or do you currently try to integrate that in and just your learnings uh, for the children and, and for those around you and the family? So we, or let me talk about myself. So I really do believe in this whole 360 holistic vision, which is circularity. So if you understand the concept of the closed loop, you'll understand that we're all part of this huge ecosystem. And there isn't one without the other. So inclusivity is extremely crucial for how we operate. And that includes every, every peoples and every nation. So yeah, we, we are very inclusive. We bring up the kids in, in that way. So the children go out, they, for example, if we're in Croatia and we transfer to Berlin, for them it's normal. They're not gonna say, ah, oh, people look a bit different here or um, people operate a bit different. So for them, it's more of a learning experience and they adapt to the situation depending on what's necessary or how they feel comfortable. And then we come to Malta and people, yes, do look different because it's a multicultural country. You have people ranging from all sorts of shades really. So, <laughs> and, they're very open to everyone. They smile at everyone. And I think it's more of an energetic connection. So if they feel good about a person, they're gonna smile, they're gonna interact, they're gonna have fun. If they don't feel too good about a person, then yeah, they, they will move on to the, to the next and continue doing what it is that they want to do. And I respect that. It's, um, I respect their feelings and I respect uh, how they interact, but I'm not going to impose any views um, are biased onto the kids. So I allow them to feel what, who it is they want to interact with in any given moment, and they do. And it, you know, color or nation doesn't really apply to them. That's beautiful. Do you, uh, does gentle parenting, you've mentioned that a couple of times now, does that integrate into this view, into this view of parenting that, you know, is kind of a, a different view of the world or, or what parts of those do you mean by gentle parenting? Can you explain that to us a little bit more? Sure. So gentle parenting is more about accepting the child for who it is that that child is uh, without trying to change them um, and allowing their, them to show their emotions, the child to feel comfortable. We do this with each other as adults, right? So I respect your views. And then we look at a child and we say, ah, oh, no, you, you were not supposed to express your views because you're still a child. And that is not what gentle parenting is. Gentle parenting is more along the lines, I respect you as a human being, as a being, um, and uh, I will give you the space and find the space for you to grow and to allow yourself to express yourself. That's wonderful. That's great. Now, did you come to this um, through a journey or were you raised with gentle parenting from your, your folks or how, how, how did that come about? Is that something that you just naturally gravitated towards or was it a journey to get there? It was a journey. So my upbringing was very different to how I 
parent. Um, but I think it's through the experiences that you go to where you realize, okay, this is what I want to continue. This is what I want to promote. And this is not what I want to promote for the next generation. And I'm grateful for my upbringing, um, but a lot of what went into my upbringing is not how I uh, bring up my, my children. Um, yeah, it was definitely a journey and it was a, a journey of empowerment as well. And it, I went through a phase where I had to reset my health because I didn't want to continue taking medication without having to without having any positive side effects. So I suffered from chronic asthma my entire life, my entire childhood and uh, teenage years. And uh, yeah, for me to reset my health took a lot of courage to say, you know what, this is, this is where my lifestyle now changes. And it went against a lot of what my peers and the people who are surrounding me in that point in my life, it went against what they believed in and what they lived. So yeah, it, it was not easy, but it was something that I really wanted and something I really believed in. And then it also spilled over into my interest in sustainability where I realized, okay, I'm, I was being a hypocrite in the past saying that I was um, a per, an eco warrior, so to speak, someone who believed in sustainability, promoting sustainability. And then I realized, oh, but I was contributing towards animal agriculture, which is one of the largest polluting um, industries that's currently known. So yeah, it was definitely a journey. And I really do believe in looking at it at, from a holistic perspective. And it all really does spill over. So my health, how I raised my children, my upbringing, circularity. Yeah, it's, it's all really a 360 perspective that you have to look, look at. That's beautiful. I'm glad to hear that you weren't struck by lightning, uh, that you didn't see God and he admonished you to become this way and that, um, that you're not a climate refugee or you know uh, something like that. A lot of the time I get to ask that question quite a bit and uh, a lot of people think there's some one aha moment or, or traumatic experience where just uh, on a turn of a dime or, or just one instant that, uh, that sets you out on this path. And I, I, I like when the realities of things come out and I hear this in, in a lot of stories is that it's usually a journey. It's a change in habits. It's a, ch it's a process over time where slowly the lights get brighter and brighter and you get to uh, see and feel that it's something that happens over over time and, and repetition and maybe some days you you have bad days and you're like oh i just it's i can't deal with it i can't do it but the more the more days that you have positive days and move forward and, and the light gets brighter it's harder to go back but also your path forward is much more optimistic you're happier you're healthier there's so many benefits out of it that it's a I guess that's the that's the point where the light does get turned up you know so it's nice to hear that that was a journey over time and that you had those nice experiences yeah it's more like a dimmer than a lightning flash <laughs> yeah 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 a lot of people you know oh I fell off a cliff I was struck by lightning or I saw God or had this vision you know there's all you know these dramatic those are um, maybe motivational or where you say, oh my goodness, that's such a grand experience, but they don't tend to be very long lasting. It's that change of habits and that gradual enlightenment that uh, moments of awe where the light gets brighter and the dimmer goes up that uh, really are sustainable and long-term because you integrate them into your lifestyle and it becomes a form of a lifestyle, the way you live, the way you think, those who you interact with and so it's not it's so nice and beautiful to hear that um i don't know if you want to go into a little bit more before we kind of move into the next uh phase of, of the conversation if you want to talk maybe touch about a little bit more about your your upbringing or your health that 
gave you ideas to say, no, I'd like to do it different? Or do you think you've touched upon those enough? Are there any, uh, any other moments that, that you think are important for us to know that maybe others are experiencing or going through that also get them to the same point to say, oh, I've got to look at it different. I've got to do it a little different. Well, I, I was lucky enough growing up to be exposed to different cultures. So my mom is Maltese and my father is Danish. So I was exposed to the, even though I grew up in Malta, I was exposed to the Scandinavian mindset of uh, being sustainable, being self-sufficient. There was an island close to, there still is an island close to where my grandparents live, which is where I spent quite a lot of time. Um, which is fully self-sustainable. They even export some of the say, electricity that they and energy that they generate. So it was always really fascinating for me to see that. And I always spoke about it. So that always was, it was always there somewhere in the background, humming and buzzing in my head. Um, but it was really when I reset my health that uh, it came to the forefront and I discovered uh, circularity and um, closed loop donut economy and anything that has to do with a with a system that is reliant on itself um, and there isn't where you realize that there isn't one without the other and uh, it's all connected there's this really complicated web of interconnectedness that sometimes we don't see because it's so complicated and people use really complicated terminology to describe it and you say ah this is too complicated for me I don't want to think about it I just want to go to the supermarket buy what's off the shelf and not have to think about it so the reality is I guess we have to find a way to make it easy for for everyone else to say you know what I don't want to think about it but I know that if I listen to someone talking about it and I can identify with the values of this person or this person and they're telling me like this is it is the way forward when you listen to other people ex other people's experience then you really can say okay maybe i can give it a try now because it's one thing say living it but it's another thing to actually uh, follow through and continue on with with that um, with that system that you want to promote, which is essentially is sustainability and circularity. Do you also um, consider yourself uh, just even in this last year, a little bit of a nomad that you can pretty much, you have the skills and, and self uh, um, ability to self-sustain that you can pretty much live anywhere with the kids and, and family? Yeah, this is how we've been living for the last three years. Definitely. Um, so we travel with the kids uh, around the world or currently mostly mainly in Europe and they adapt really easily and um, we're lucky to have great internet in, in most places that you can really do anything from anywhere. So technology has really, really helped out with that. Um, yeah, so I guess you could call me a nomad, digital nomad. <laughs> Did it, did it not used to be that way in Malta and Croatia um, that, that, that the internet wasn't always that good be, uh, when, when it first came out? Is, I mean, because I've heard Andreas mention that before and, and uh, just as kind of an, more of an infrastructure thing, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, it is an infrastructure issue. Um, I know for a fact that through my experience, walking through the streets of Zagreb in Croatia, I could use my phone as though I had the best internet connection whilst walking through the street. Um, so that was really refreshing. And then, yeah, I, we, I came back to Malta and then you see the difference. You really do start to understand, okay, something's missing, something can be better. And that's where you gain perspective and you say, okay, how can we apply something that's really working in one place and apply it to another place to actually facilitate growth and prosperity and um, uh, a better quality of life. And this includes internet connection and um, yeah, cellular connection. Yeah, I, I agree. You know, there's, um, we, or at least I talk about about it a lot in the UN and, and other futurists and, and um, 
thought leaders really talk about this, the rising billions, those who are going to be coming online around the world, uh, mainly in Africa, but also in India and other places in the world where they're going to be getting smartphones and uh, that the internet's going to go from 3G to LTE to, to um, you know, or 5G, you know, it's just going to keep growing and getting better. And eventually, you know, we're talking about Starlink broadband from Elon Musk, where, you know, there won't be one global SIM and one global internet connection. And, you know, no, no borders or nations of, of calling plans and things. It's, you know, one global type of telephone number, and no matter who you reach out to on the internet or phone, that, that's all connected. But that rising billions is also kind of an infrastructural thing because there's something that changes or occurs in humanity when that when that happens when that shifts uh, so when, when you guys bring that up I, I like to you know it's 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 not just Africa it's not just a uh, really uh, uh, impoverished or horrible places there's places in Germany there's places in in, in uh, uh, Portugal and Spain and other places where the connectivity could be a lot better where it's a, where the infrastructure could be a lot better. The sanitation and infrastructure could be a lot better. And as those infrastructures get raised or boosted up, it changes the civilization. And that, yeah. that leads me to my question is kind of you over the past, since we last saw each other at the Malta Innovation Summit, are you feeling more and more a civilization framework unrest or um, any, any worries about, you know, a collapse or, or issues with our world or environment? Or what are your feelings or sense about our current global civilization frameworks or models that we're operating on? I mean, thanks to technology, we can reach anyone anywhere in the world with one click of a button. So that's pretty, um, pretty impressive. And it, it's actually a way to connect us. And if you look at it as a way of connection and as a way of boosting each other, then you can only see prosperity and growth and um, a better future for the next generation and for the people of tomorrow. So for example, Maya could connect to someone who's living in India and have a virtual education of what it's like to be in that culture, a part of that culture, the food that they eat on a daily basis, the people that they communicate, the languages that they speak. And it's difficult to do that without technology. You know, India has many, they speak many languages in India. So, and you can do it in, in a similar way in Australia. So throughout the pandemic, we found these uh, online, online tours of um, different places, say museums around the world, where they were giving virtual tours to anyone who signs in. This was not possible a few years ago. And this is a great way of, for example, learning about art without having to be physically there. <laughs> That's beautiful, yeah. I, uh, during this pandemic, we created uh, with Ted education and the united nations we created the earth school which was a 30 um 30 day challenge type of a deal mixed between half online learning and half outside learning so we'd take a combination where they would learn things online through tedx um, earth school and then go outside in their neighborhood where they're at or in their kitchen and try to create or apply those learnings directly. And I call them quests, 30 day quests. So I really, I believe there is a big gift. And as those infrastructures and those technologies get up to speed with our exponentially growing world, and especially if those te technologies that emerging technologies are, are circular and ones that run on renewable energy and that are good for human health and our planet, ones that are not creating just as much, uh, you know, fossil fuels or energy waste or, or, or waste period in the process of those emerging technologies that um, our world really will, will begin to, to, to evolve and start looking much different. Um, I, I feel like this, um, 
for me personally that our current civilization framework in a lot of areas or pockets around the world are beginning not to work for us anyway, uh, anymore. Like, you know, uh, let's take the Trumpocalypse or the Bolsonaro's or the Putin's or the Shays or the Duarte's or the Erdogan's or the Brexit's that um, people are becoming more civilly uh, unrested and uh, unhappy with the, the current models of the frameworks. Uh, now we need to keep them spinning and afloat and working, but we also need to transition to maybe something better. And, and the whole main process of a circular economy or donut economy or donut models is one of a different civilization framework. I speak a lot about uh, sustainable development goals. Most people don't know it's not a, an add-on to business as usual or just an add-on to a new governance system. It's a completely new civilization framework and, and kind of on a short term, just to get us to 2030 to give us a different infrastructure on a global scale. And so that's why I mentioned this, you know, this, this civilization framework thoughts or ideas from what you've said in the past, I'm getting the strong feeling that for you, it's the circular economy is that new civilization framework that really for us all is something that will work for us all. Is, am I understanding that correct? Or do you think it'll be a hybrid out of a, a couple different ones? Or what are your thoughts on that? It will work for us all. Our very physiology is based on circularity and the concepts of circularity. So you were talking about what you, your project together with uh, TED Education, right? And that, that project really empowers individuals to the extent where I, I can go to other, I can easily connect with other individuals who are experts in the field. And that way I can transfer knowledge really fast and at the, mo at the most optimal, uh, in the most optimal way. So it doesn't go to say, um, this expert here has to teach a whole bunch of students who will then teach other students. A lot of knowledge is lost um, through that model, which is the current education system. But instead I can connect directly with the expert and really expand and uh, progress to something so much greater than what used to happen. And, uh, and this is te thanks to technology and uh, programs and uh, education models like what you did with uh, your 30 day quest. So. Yeah, that, I appreciate that. Yeah, it's, I, I agree with it. And um, I think that those are ones that empower um, human beings. And uh, this one was specifically for grade school uh, kids uh, clear up to high school to give them something during the pandemic where a lot of kids were not going to school. A lot of uh, schools were closed or they switched to some form of an online model. And uh, we were feeling and hearing a lot of feedback from parents um, that one, they didn't have enough technology or internet connection at home to be able to, if they had more than one child to, to to give them each a separate computer and, and, and to have them do their homework or that they weren't prepared to help them with their, their homework. They didn't know what to do. They weren't, they didn't feel like they were a teacher or an educator. And um, I, I believe, and that, that's why I like your gentle parenting and, and um, your, your way of living, because uh, I believe that you are not relying upon anybody else um, to provide you the solutions or deliver the future for you that you're actually trying to take a part in life and in these complex systems and, and um, see yourself as an integrated part of how we can better that or how we can better our education or our living systems or parenting or birth or empowerment. And so, um, you know, I know you're, you still have some young ones that are really not in, in totally in the educational system yet, but uh, I, I believe you are, already have some ideas of how that's going to go in the future. And, and that, would you want to tell us about any of that at all? Right now, we are exploring, exploring different models and ways of doing things. Um, 
when it comes to Magnus Rus II, he learns by doing, he plays, and this is how he learns. And he can, he's, when he was one and a half, he could say his numbers, he could say all the alphabet. And this is only because he played, because he spent time with his sister, because they have conversations together and they're not separated because there's an age difference. Um, and this is one of the way, like one of the ways of learning is not to separate, but to actually integrate. And it doesn't matter what age you are. If you're interested in the same subject, that's what matters, sharing that knowledge. And um, when you're sharing knowledge, you forget about borders, you know? Absolutely. It's not natural to start saying, ah, there's a border, there's a line, and this is where it ends. It doesn't happen that way. That's, that's great. Yeah, that's nice. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get to my absolute hardest question for you today, and that is the burning question, WTF. I also gave it to Andreas. It's not the swear word. It's what's the future? And I don't want to know for... Malta or Croatia or governments, I want to know for you, what's the future? What's your vision? If you were um, to say, this is how it's going to be, or you had an optimistic view or a real a prediction, what's the future? The children really are, are the future. So I really do believe in empowering the younger generation because they are the ones who are gonna make a difference. I might, I might already be too late to make a big impact, but the impact they will make, that's crucial. Especially at the stage that we are right now, where we have, if you look at the statistics of um, how the climate is changing, the children are the future and they, they are the crucial, crucial turning point. Uh, within all of this, yeah. That's great, that's great. Um, do you, you believe that um, there are some basic principles or philosophies out there that, um, that we need to give our children? So there are the future but what we're hearing, I mean, even with this Earth School and what we're seeing around the world is that the quality of education around the world is not the same. And um, that even though they are the future, how do we create an infrastructure for them? Because I'm not sure we can, that we can just say, okay, you guys got to not only, you are our future, but you've got to create that infrastructure as well. Is there things or philosophies that you think we could help them along the way to, to better that future? Absolutely. Um, empower them. Have them ask questions. Have them really explore and express their opinions and not tell them what to think or how to think, but have conversations together with children. Because really and truly, I learned so much through my conversations with Maya and even my conversations with Magnus, who is only two. And sometimes I catch myself and I say, wow, okay, I just learned that. I have to reel it in and say, okay, thank you for, for having me explore and experience this side and uh, experience this perspective as opposed to the model I was currently uh, um, expressing. So I really do learn from children and I express that I am learning from them as much as they are learning from me. And uh, this empowerment will, will create the new normal, will create new systems and new models and they're already being created. We just don't see them right now. So what we do with education, uh, the way we raise them through gentle parenting, the way that they eat healthily and uh, fo we focus on plant-based living. All of this, this is creating a system, but we might not identify it as a closed box. So we don't identify it within these borders, but it is a system. And it's a system that for them is normal. For the kids, it's normal to eat fruit and vegetables every day, uh, actually enjoy eating them. Um, they aren't exposed, so we ask, we always ask questions. We say, for example, when it comes to Maya, 
uh, we say, we do ask her like, can you please think about what this, this thing or this item, this object, this toy um, is how it's made, understand where it comes from, the, the materials that are used, who has to source those materials. So basically the entire, um, the entire lifeline of this product is taught about before we start. So we think about all of that before we actually start using it because this is how you empower kids. You have to ask them questions and they have to think about it themselves. And that is empowering. So we don't just use items. We think about where it comes from, how it's made, the people, the processes, because that's the entire system. It's all interconnected. It's a, a circular closed loop. So most, more, I think most children nowadays don't really think about all of that, but it's very empowering to understand where the items that you use on a daily basis come from and the so, people who are involved in, in creating them. Yeah, that, the, I, I've, I've, I've stalked you online and watched some of your videos and, and uh, over the years. And so you, you do videos on uh, zero waste living or zero waste tools. You do videos on um, healthy foods and healthy type of living. What's what some tools or tricks or tips are on to, to, to make it easier or to create it into a system that's kind of almost automatic or one that, that you know eases your life. You do uh, uh, videos about um, uh, breastfeeding and how to how to transition your your infant or your child. Uh, on natural weaning methods and things like that. Um, are, are there certain things that you've done in the past that are uh, empowering children in general or empowering girls, women and girls and, and kind of giving that or what are your feelings about empowerment of women and girls? It all starts with respecting the individual and respecting the individual's wishes. So if Maya wants to learn about buildings, uh, I think there's a video online where she says she wants to learn ab about buildings and princesses. You know, if she wants to learn about buildings, then we respect her wish to learn about buildings and also princesses because that's what her wish is. But it has nothing, it has nothing to do with gender because it, as an individual, we're respecting her wishes. So that's very important to listen to the child and to listen and understand that that's an individual who has in their own interests and we don't have to force them to do something that they're not interested in because only by doing the things that they are interested in will they reach their full potential, will they contribute most to society, will they maybe create the next big thing, you know? One thing we didn't touch upon is that, um, and I don't know, you didn't mention, but you have the, a little bit of a ballerina uh, background, isn't that correct? Yeah, that, that is correct, yes. And, and did it get to a real professional level or did you do more national or local community type of uh, shows and, and uh, things around? I did quite a lot of uh, shows in Malta. I also did dance outside of Malta. So I won a few scholarships back in the day to go visit some different countries and dance uh, with other artists. That was really, that was also one of like, being exposed to those different cultures was really eye-opening and did broaden my perspective when it comes to everything that I'm doing today. Um, but yeah, I wouldn't say I was a professional, maybe maybe semi-professional. Uh, okay. I got injured, which, were, which had to do also with my health. And then when I reset my health, I, my, I recovered really quickly. But then I wasn't a part of, wow, this is, I just discovered this whole concept of circularity and I really love this and I want to continue on this path. So uh, my, my dancing days are still here. I just don't uh, don't don't do it professionally or semi-professionally anymore. 
You've, but have you transitioned to some yoga practices or some breathing practices that are kind of in your daily routine at all? I breathe every day. <laughs> so I make sure to breathe every day. Um, it's, it's really important to breathe and to know how to breathe. So that is really crucial. Um, yeah, when it comes to yoga, um, you mean by the, phys the physical aspect of yoga? Just, I mean, is there anything that you've, you've, you've been practicing there as kind of, you know, uh, um, a different way to keep your, yourself uh, stressed and limber and, and, and healthy? Or is that, uh, is there any other practice? Because I know you do the breathing with uh, Andreas. I also do the breathing. I also practice the Wim Hof and a couple other, other things. I was just wondering if there's a... I started incorporating that, uh, the cold showers. Those are, are, are really refreshing. I had one today and it really does, um, how do you say, you can say wake you up, right? But it's, it's definitely nice. The Wim, I, I do enjoy the Wim Hof method. Um, during our pandemic lockdown in Croatia, when we had no hot water, I wasn't too keen on it, but <laughs> I'm starting to integrate it once again into my daily routine after giving birth to Mira and it's 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 actually I think it's been really crucial in my recovery and uh, I feel like I'm almost fully recovered now um, and then yeah I do I do uh, make sure that my body is supple uh, so I do stretch I do go for for walks we are lucky and blessed to be surrounded by nature here in Malta so I do enjoy that quite a lot um, always out and about amongst trees so something very therapeutic uh, the moment I don't know if you've experienced this but when you're in the city and the moment you enter a park and there are trees the energy shifts you feel better instantly just because you're around trees and I think it has to do with ionization right yes. so it's scientifically proven that it does boost your mood which is which in turn also boosts your immune system and it's you'll stay healthier for longer in that way. Yeah, yeah it, ch it changes a lot of things just by having uh, daily interactions with nature, uh, whether it's a, a city park or whether it's, you know, a nature walk uh, outside of the city and in different areas. There's a lot of uh, wonderful benefits uh, for, for health on that as well. So I'm glad to hear that you're doing the breathing, a little bit of the Wim Hof. I, it's, no matter how many times you take that cold shower or the cold bath, uh, it's like the first time, it's always a reset. It's not like, oh, okay, it's getting easier. It's, um, it, it, do it doesn't get any easier, but the benefits of, of vitality and energy and um, so many, many things combined with the, the breathing are just uh, enormous. They're, they're really wonderful and, and fun. Um, to, to give you good optimism. I, I want to, before we kind of wrap wrap up, I want to find out a little bit more about uh, ACT and, and tell me why you co-founded it, what what the thought was behind it and um, uh, how how has it been so far or what what uh, what was the purpose? It's mainly specific on Malta and um, what other region there? Um, Mainly Malta. So okay. ACT is really about regenerating Malta from a multifaceted perspective, including um, the ecosystem here, which is nutrition deficient. So, so yeah, the soil is highly nutrient deficient. And the whole concept was to really reset all of that and to share the knowledge that we had learned um, throughout the years, including um, healthy living and focusing on plant-based uh, lifestyle. Um, so that was an interesting, how did we start, how did we co-found ACT? I was living in London at the time and working with a company and uh, focusing also on, the, on a project uh, related to the World Economic Forum in Davos. Um, and I realized how I was working all the time and, you know, it wasn't how I wanted to live the rest of my life. 
and I decided to come back to Malta together with Claude, who was at the time working together with the, a government entity here in Malta. And he also wasn't fully happy with the nine to five aspect of life. And uh, yeah, we co-founded ACT together with some other individuals who were inspirational and inspired. And uh, we had a good time doing it. And uh, we really do apply our, our values to the whole concept of what ACT is all about. Um, so all the projects that we do really encompass all our, our values and that's openness, transparency, um, sustainability, circularity, and knowledge sharing. That's really important, sharing knowledge. Yeah. That, that's beautiful. Um, what, what's been one of the most uh, uh, beautiful projects you've done or something that, that you, I mean, what when you were at the uh, Malta Innovation Summit, was there something you guys were specifically doing at that time, or is there any uh, any other good stories you can tell us about ACT or experiences? So when we met at the Innovation Summit, that was at the infancy of, we had just started ACT. Um, and since then we have been, we have created a project called Sajar, which is a 1 million tree plantation project. It's, it's not only a 1 million tree plantation. So we didn't only focus on planting trees. We focused on regenerating the natural habitat of Malta. Um, so we really understood the entire ecosystem. So we applied the concept of circularity to how we were going to plant the trees. Uh, and that has been one of the most beautiful projects that I've had the pleasure of being a part of. Um, it has been, I learned a lot and it's nice to see how excited people get when you talk about, when you connect the dots and say, you know what, it's not only about be planting trees, it's about understanding the ecosystem in that particular area to make sure that the tree can survive all by itself for the next 200, 2000 years. So, and that, that is a beautiful concept. We see, we see a lot of um, organizations uh, plant trees as part of their CSR uh, mission and they die after two years or they don't even grow to the full potential. So the tree doesn't grow to its full potential. It remains short and then eventually dies. And then the soil around it is completely deficient of nutrients because it was planted in the wrong type of soil and the ecosystem that's surrounding it so yeah you present a holistic view and people get excited about it because it makes sense that's beautiful so to, to finish up i have uh three more questions and they're very sel selfish they're for my listeners i want you to um depart your wisdom and um if there was one message you could depart to our listeners that was a sustainable takeaway that has the power to change their life, what would it be basically your message? Think in simple terms and use what you already have instead of going out to buy new things. So even though it's not sustainable, throwing that item away and buying something new which is sustainable in itself, that whole concept is not really sustainable. So use up what you currently have and um, don't be afraid to make mistakes. We all do. What should uh, young innovators, young uh, mothers uh, in, in your field be thinking about if they are looking for ways to make real impact on, on their world? If you're applying, okay, when you apply things to your life and you share that knowledge uh, and you share the shortcomings and you share the positive impact that it had on your life, that's, that's a place you can really make an impact because people can relate to that. So if you make it relatable, then you can make a real impact. So I'm, I'm not saying that you're super old because you're not. But what have you experienced or learned in this journey or in your life so far 
that you would have loved to know from the start or something that you would have said, boy, had I only known this, I would have started much sooner. Oh, but if I knew about all that, then I would have <laughs> my journey, right? Yep. So I'm actually very happy that I went through my journey. There's, there isn't really anything that I wish I had known sooner because if I probably knew that thing sooner, then it wouldn't have had the impact and the long lasting impact. That's the most important, the long lasting impact that it has had on me. So I'm very happy with how my journey turned out. <laughs> That's great. That's a perfect answer. So uh, oh, uh, you got it right. Ding, ding, ding. Yeah, I was keeping score. No, there's no right or wrong answer, but that is, uh, that is so wise of you beyond your years of wisdom. That's a perfect advice because it's really about, uh, it's not about the short-term profits. It's not about the short-term rewards it's really an infinite game it's much more long term it's about the journey and um, it, there's no skipping steps which is is kind of a conundrum in our world because our world is growing exponentially around us good bad and ugly and sometimes we say how can we keep up with our exponentially growing world we cannot st skip steps uh, on that journey because some of that process is very vital it gives us important learnings that we need to apply. Uh, the, the, the chance that we have as, as human beings is really not that we skip the steps or speed up the, the, the time in that journey. It's more that we get the, hit the critical mass, the collective where we unify ourselves as humanity and communities and groups and use that collective power of those communities of those families of those like minds um, that we can hit a critical mass which will take us on that exponential journey to have some some really fabulous impacts on our world and in and, 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 and pretty expedient amount of time as well so um, but it's not about skipping any any step of, uh, of helping us to get into this homo symbiosis, this uh, yeah. symbiotic earth, this connection with our wonderful it, planet. It's really about the impact that we make because we're not everlasting, but the impact that we make, that, that lives on. That's absolutely for sure. Unless yeah. there's something else you didn't get to say that you would like to say you can say that now or if you have any questions for me um that would be uh this would be your chance otherwise i'm gonna thank you so much and say goodbye you can show us i would love to you you because yeah. she's been amazing she's sleeping right now she has been beautiful i, I love it works oh she is beautiful what a beautiful baby yeah, so oh. she's peacefully sleeping. She woke up a few times, but fell asleep yeah, again. Yeah, she woke up very cheerfully. I heard the nice, the nice goose and uh, okay. little, it was beautiful. I love it. Yeah, so it was nice. Thank you for having the both of us. <laughs> You're most welcome. I'm so so glad it worked out. And like I, uh, like I mentioned to you, I just became a fourth time grandpa October fourteenth. My son's wife had had their first baby um soraya and so i i love uh, children and babies and and good um parenting methods and and the long-term view and so i'm really excited and happy for you guys and i'm glad that we had a chance to catch up and and let our listeners kind of know uh your wonderful perspective and a different view on the world and i'm going to include some links in the description so if they want to reach out or follow you or get in touch with you or collaborate that uh, i'm sure you're very willing and open to do that as well absolutely thank you very much for having us once again and congratulations on being a four-time grandpa <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much it's so good to see you you take care thank you thank you bye, -bye. bye. Thank you.